Hello everyone and welcome to day 53 of Bitwise, where we code a complete software hardware stack for a simple computer from scratch. Today we continue with logic design. End of last stream, most of last stream, we wrote the simulator. Um, and just to, to refresh your memory, what this means is we can now, is it, I can't remember if it's here. Uh, I think I probably moved it to the main file, didn't I? Um, so yeah, you have you have a simulator where you can compile a module to um, you can compile here we have a very simple module, but you can compile modules to Python code, and they give you a class that um, that you can you can call it sort of as a, in a purely functional way if you just want to evaluate it as purely as a function of inputs, but it's also sort of anticipating uh, very soon when we will be do, working with synchronous sequential systems that have internal state that, that has to be, has to be tracked. So encapsulating it in a class like this is going to be convenient, um, and so it, do, it does this just by linearizing the, the circuit and then mapping it to equivalent Python operations, and we're exploiting the fact that you know bit vectors that are wider than 64 bits can easily be worked with as Python uh, big ints. So uh, this will let us actually test stuff, which is very nice. Um, so today I was planning to getting back into logic design now that we have the simulator uh, because I didn't want to go much further without being able to actually simulate stuff and you just having to take my word for it that stuff works. So um, maybe let's go back to uh, to some of this earlier stuff and uh, simulate that things work as expected. Um, so uh, remember what we were doing last time when we were working on this piece. I showed you how to do a ripple carry adder uh, where all the uh, the carries are just chained together. You have a, uh, a delay that's linear in the number of bits and then I showed you how using that as a sort of configurable block and by feeding, uh, by having a, uh, a configurable carry in bit and by uh, controlling exactly what is fed to the inputs. Uh, you can actually use this to do two's complement subtraction and also um, inequality comparisons. And so that was one of the last things we, we, we finished with, which is this. Um, I, now, I was actually not sure if this will work or if this would uh, if this would work if I got some of these equations wrong because it's a little, the way I'm writing it is a little bit unconventional, uh, although I kind of convinced myself at the time that I was right, but now we can actually test it by running some simulations. But before we do that, let's uh, just do the adder. So uh, here we have example 7 is a 7-bit adder. Um, let me just remind you what that looks like. Uh, we have to rerun. Uh, sorry, didn't set up with this. So let's see, dot t example dot. Okay, so that's this sort of deal. Uh, each of these add threes is a so-called full adder. It takes three input bits with the same weight. Outputs two output bits, one with the same weight as the inputs, which is the sum bit, and one with uh, one one weight higher, which is supposed to go into the next bit position. And so those are just chained together. This is basically school like this is the normal decimal. This is the normal sort of pen and paper addition algorithm you learn just with uh, excuse me with with uh, binary rather than decimal. Um, all right, so let's test it. Let's actually simulate it. So um, I'm going to compile example three. I guess it's example seven. First, let's make sure this doesn't explode. Uh, it didn't, which is good because I haven't actually tested it off stream on anything more complicated than what I showed last time. Um, so let's see if this works. <clears throat> so I can feed in two things, um, X and Y, and um, you know, they're kind of treated for the most part since we're not working with where you can use addition insider circuits but here we're building adders so we're not supposed to use adders uh, that would be cheating this is all bitwise stuff so this is all synthesized by treating the thing as a bit vector but really we can also just feed in you know like a real a real number um or an integer not a real number but, a, but an actual number not like a, a list of things or something like that so um we can we can uh, evaluate this and i can feed in um, so it's it's four bits, which means maximum value is well zero to fifteen inclusive. So if I do something like three plus four, I guess I should get seven. So um, we get seven. So you you get a bundle. Keep in mind this is kind of like a named tuple. 
Um, it's very rare that a circuit only returns one value, so it's sort of set up for the general case where you're returning more than one value. Uh, you can just do dot s if you want that uh, output. Uh, if I do, let's see, um, if I if I do like uh, 9 plus 9, what should I get? 18 modulo, 16 should be 2. And so this looks right, um, but actually let's, uh, let's, let's verify it. So what you can do is you can brute force test um, by simply iterating over all possible uh, addends, uh, all things we can add. And then we're going to add them as Python integers, which uh, we have to always keep in mind this is um, going to be big int. Well, in particular here, it's definitely, you know, we have to mask off the bits. So we're going to uh, keep only the lowest, um, well, and let me just write it as a mask here. So, so we have like num bits is, is four, um, and then we create this mask, and then we iterate over uh, all the possible things we can add. And then I'm going to assert that um, if we compute it with Python math using a, you know, like a, a real, you know, the real addition, we're going to get what we get from our circuit. And I really hope we do. We don't. Um, that's because we're not feeding in the right values. So that works. Let me just get rid of that debug print. The whole code being printed is just because I've been working on this. So uh, let's get rid of that. Um, so anyway, this is brute force verification that um, the adder works. Um, let, let me make a general comment uh, about this kind of brute force verification. Um, I don't know if this is something anyone who is an actual chip designer or verification engineer in that community would, would co-sign. But one thing I've noticed is that um, if you write a circuit in a way that's parameterized by the bit width and you take note of sort of the general edge cases, like for example, if you're doing divide and conquer where you cut things in two, make sure that it's a power of two or, or, uh, or something like that, uh, at least relative to the thing you're ultimately going to use it for. Um, it seems to me like you can make a general statement that based on the shape of the circuit and the fact that it's parametric, if you if it works brute force for a smaller operand width, it will work for any arbitrary operand width. Um, and at least casually, based on sort of casual inspection of the circuit, you can say that. Basically by saying that there's nothing special about the number of bits. It's sort of uniform. And insofar as it isn't uniform, like if there's divide and conquer, you can still characterize the non-uniformity. And my point is that um, brute force search for those sort of param parametric circuits is totally reasonable if you can just bring down um, the size to something reasonable. So in this case, here there's only 256 combinations. If we had to go over a 32-bit adder, we would that would be two to the 64 combinations. It would never finish. Um, but we don't need to if we have some idea of the regularity of the circuit and how and whether it's parametric. So uh, you know the point is even though we only tested this for a four-bit adder. Uh, really, uh, I have confidence it should work for any number of bits, except maybe zero, you know, except for some degenerate case. So brute force search um, is totally reasonable in those sort of cases. Um, even if the number of bits you're brute forcing over is for sort of a smaller instance of the circuit or something like that. Uh, all right, so let's uh, let's do subtraction. Um, uh, boom, boom, boom. So the subtractor was example eight. Um, so let's just instantiate another uh, another simulation here. Um, I think we use the same number of bits in all cases. We can just reuse these masks. Um, and so in this case, um, let's see if this actually works quite like this, because I think it will, but uh, what, what is, OK, so this is S as well. Whether this is just the right thing in terms of two's complement, I think it should. Um, but um, yeah, so that works too. Um, so this means our subtractor, which is based on two's complement, right? So, so, so see what we uh, see what, what what sub does. It just adds, but it bitwise negates the second operand, and then has a carry input of one rather than zero. Um, so okay, so that's it for that. Now let's try um, this example ten, which is where we had, I would say, uncertainty about. Okay, I, yeah. There was some uncertainty around whether um, these are still four bit, right? Yeah. There was some uncertainty around whether um, 
um, whether those equations were right. So let, let's start with the unsigned. Um, for, for the for the signed, we have to be careful about how we do it because we want to use signed comparison on the Python side, but that means we we have to reinterpret the unsigned integer as a signed integer as two's complement uh, with four bits or whatever. But let's do the unsigned first um, as a starter. So we're going to verify that um, x less than um, x less than y unsigned is the same as if we uh, evaluate this circuit. There's only two operands, right? Yeah. If we evaluate this circuit and take the LCU uh, output, and this you know this may not work. It doesn't work. That's fine. Um, we should probably store this off so I can easily uh, look at it. Actually, I get is it? I can't. Maybe I flipped the sense. I'm checking whether x minus y is less than zero, which is equivalent to whether x is less than y. Um, I think if I did it correctly. All right. Um, well, let's see what's going on here. Okay, so here's an assertion violation. Um, LTU is one, so X is zero. Yeah, that's not right. I... So what are we computing? If you think about what the math is doing, we're computing X plus this plus one. So that's X plus all ones. So if, if you do it, uh, let me just write it like Python notation. And we're writing this. This is equivalent to, this definitely has an output carry. So maybe this is, no. Um, let's see, um, we take the carry out, um, so this is the very first case, what did I say here, this is equivalent to uh, 1 and then or zero, so this has a carry. Um, are the operands reversed? Because any anything added to minus one like this is going to like so zero certainly because of the this carry or uh, the, the, the the in carry one and it's also going to carry if you do a plus one there um, oh no but I'm what am I th what's my thinko here so conceptually, what I want to do is I want to zero extend with one more bit. Then I add one. I mean, this is the same, but I'm just writing it out like this to uh, help myself. Um, yeah, why, why was I assuming this was going to give the right result? Um, So this gives that. What if I mm.
Oh, I see what you're saying. Okay, let me let me let me just verify that. I wasn't. I I should have. I'm not sure how much I want to spend time debugging this in stream. Okay, you're right. So so really, this is the negation. If I want to think of it that way. Oops, that's not what I meant. Am I high? Uh, this, if you're not greater than or equal to y, you're less than y, right? Okay, I, I let's call it GEU, and and not. I I should have thought about this more. It's embarrassing. I hadn't understood that as well as I thought. Um, let's try this one. Um, so same circuit, but now I'm going to go from um, uh, let's see, we want to start, I guess there's different ways I could express this iteration, but you want to start at um, this minus one inclusive and go up to this uh, minus one inclusive. We're sorry. Let, let me actually uh, write this out. Like uh, I'll say u int is this, and s int is. Uh, Can verify that these look reasonable. Okay, that's 0 to 16 inclusive, minus 8 to 8 in, uh, exclusive. Sorry, I think there's a small issue in the simulator um, where I don't mask in a case where I should. Just one sec. So GEUS is T30, T30 is T31. Which is one three T three T four um, T five. Those are all one bits. Hmm. 
maybe the problem is when you do something like this in Python. Uh, now, what am I thinking of? I think the problem is not actually. Yeah, that's the issue. Not is interpreted as a signed operation because you're dealing with arbitrary precision ends. So, um, what did I say? Yeah, so, dust op. Um, I don't think that was the issue. I saw another thing there, but this is definitely something we have to fix. So, okay, now this is an actual value, a uh, Boolean value. Um, all right, let's not go down this rabbit hole. I will revisit this later. Um, I was not kind of mentally prepared to, to work through the, the specific thing. I haven't thought about it for like a week. Um, so maybe I will return to this comparison thing later. Um, well... Maybe I, this is the one I thought through is, yeah, okay, so I'm, so, okay, never mind. So I think what happened is when I was thinking through the original, when I was thinking through the original stuff, I was mentally thinking through, oh, I see the issue. Okay, let me, let me explain to you what I think the issue is. Okay, I see the bug now. I see the bug. Um. So look at this carry equation here, which turned out to be correct. So this is the one I actually understood in my head. Note that you are, um, this thing here is basically the, the sine extended bit. Um, the original one was zero, but then it gets negated, so it's one. So when you're, basically, if you think about what's being fed to this subtractor, I'm feeding the minus the thing. And it's minus the sine, the zero extended thing, which means it's going to always be one extended, basically, for that operand. Which means that relative to, if uh, relative to this down here, but I thought that's what we did before. Oh no! I, so so the problem before when I did the bitwise negation is that it didn't do the masking. So that was actually um, two bugs interacting in a way that confused me about the the real cause. So now we're on on firm, on firm footing, I believe. LTU. Um, and then this is LTS. Why are there two of these? Um, LTU, LTU. Um, okay, we're good. So I was basically right in my original mental model, except that I forgot about the fact that the second operand is, neg is bitwise negated, which means that the extension, uh, when it's interpreted as an unsigned thing, needs to always be one. Because you don't zero extend, you know, sorry, you don't zero extend first, you bitwise negate, then zero extend, or then, it's then sign extend, basically, if you think of it as a subset of what's going on with the signed integers. All right. So now we're on, we're good. Uh, I wasn't crazy. Okay. Um, but but anyway, so we verified that, I guess this is the some of the more non-trivial stuff we've done so far, that, that all of this behaves as expected, which is good. Um, I wanted to, today, there's all kinds of different directions we could take this. I was originally planning to talk about shifters today, um, but, I, but uh, I want to talk about adders instead, because uh, fast adders, basically. So we're doing ripple carry adders right now. Um, I think we can basically, we can implement most of the adders you will find in fairly advanced textbooks within this session and test them. Uh, and so that's my plan. Uh, and we're gonna have to use more than four bits. We'll probably do eight by eight, you know, eight, eight plus eight bits or something like that. But uh, I think this will be really cool. It's a little bit advanced, I think for, you, you can absolutely make an argument that it's way too advanced and it's unnecessary. Adder, uh, adders and FPJs are mostly based on hard blocks, but um, part of what I'm trying to do is also kind of teach you ideas, not just uh, cut out everything that's not needed in a narrow practical sense. And I think this stuff is extremely cool. Uh, and I've kind of been obsessed with some of the related topics recently because there's all kinds of applications outside of adders and parallel programming and GPU programming and stuff like that. So. 
Uh, I was just having a conversation with Fabian on Twitter, and so I was like, okay, let's let's change the today's topic a little bit and just do fast adders instead of my original planned topics of, of shifters, and then we'll do shifters at the end, depending on how quickly we can get to it. But I suspect it's mostly going to be adders today. So, all right. Um, uh, back to back to how we were doing adders. Remember, we had this basic thing called add three. This is a basic uh, full adder unit. Um, and uh, by chaining them together, you get a ripple carry adder. Um, the, the problem with ripple carry adders, as we observed, and you, as you can see in this diagram, is that the critical path goes all the way from the lowest bit, indeed from the input carry, if there is one from, from, the, from outside, all the way through the whole chain to the highest output bit. So it's, it's linear in the number of bits. Um, if you have a 64-bit adder, which is you know, the standard word size on modern processors, each um, uh, on in, in sort of on modern chips, you measure delay in units of so-called FO4, which means that if you have one inverter driving four other inverters, it turns out the delay of a circuit is based not just on you know in a narrow sense the input-output delay of a unit, but also how much uh, stuff it's connected to. Uh, and so the canonical unit of measurement, for reasons that I won't go into, the, mag the, four, the, the number four is actually magical for mathematical reasons. In, something related to uh, a certain kind of balancing act between two equations that that are uh, that, that, that intersect at uh, between four and five so people use this uh, unit of delay called fo4 um, and a modern processor cycle time probably has time in one cycle for maybe 10 fo4s or something like that um, and incredibly, so that's basically if you take one inverter, which is the simplest, pretty much sim the simplest static logic element there is, and if it feeds four other things and you put 10 layers of those, that's a pretty simple circuit if you think about it. I think you only have time for about 10 of those layers from the start of one clock cycle to the next. Um, and um, that's not a lot of time if you have 64 bits, right? Like even one full adder is probably going to be a couple of FO4 delays. And then multiply that by 64, and you have something that's more like 100 rather than 10, you know. Um, and so uh, this just doesn't scale to these very, uh, you know, even 32-bit for that matter. Like uh, these kind of ripple carry adders, uh, there are there are things you can optimize actually. Uh, but uh, like Fabian was pointing out, there was a paper by someone at ARM where they did some tricks with fast ripple carry adders. Um, but that I think that was still not designed for 64-bit. It was designed for you know, like specialized fixed point DSP type applications where you have narrower, uh, more specialized widths. But but anyway, the, the point is this kind of, even if you optimize everything in here, like at the very fine grain, you're still looking at some kind of linear function, uh, which for 64 bits is not going to work. Like you know, the fastest ripple carry adder in the world is still going to have more than one FO4 delay per, per bit, and 64 times 1 is greater than what you can accomplish in one cycle on a, uh, on a fast processor with a high clock rate. So you need to do fancier things. And I will start with what I think is the simplest from a, um, from a software perspective, and then I'll move to the stuff that's a little more sophisticated, but what people actually tend to use in practice uh, based on parallel prefix adders. But I'll start with the one that I think... Um, so sort of, if you're a software guy, I think this is kind of congenial to the way you're used to thinking about algorithms, maybe. Um, um, so uh, what you can basically do, so, so if you think about what the problem is with this kind of linear structure, the problem is, in some sense, uh, the last adder in the chain can't, in some sense, get started until all the previous ones have finished. So here's the idea. What if you can do speculative execution? There's only two possible input carries. It can be a zero or a one. What if you compute both possibilities? So you compute the result assuming a zero input carry, and you compute the input, uh, you compute the output assuming a, a, a one carry. And then once you actually learn what the the carry was, uh, then you just select between them with a mux. So the reason this works so efficiently for adders is that there's only two possible input carries. And this fact turns out to be key for uh, all the advanced uh, adder designs. 
if you had like a million possible things that could come down the line, then speculative execution would be prohibitive because you would have to compute a million possible uh, possibilities and then only select one of them. That just wouldn't be feasible, either in area and probably also in delay because you would have to fan out, but especially in area, it wouldn't be feasible. Um, so, so the basic idea behind a lot of this stuff is some sort of uh, speculative execution, but let me, but, but the simplest version is what I just described, which is called carry select addition. Um, and the idea is we take the adder chain, we cut it in half somewhere to decouple those higher and low parts. Then we instantiate an adder for the upper part uh, under two assumptions. The first is that the input carry is zero, and the second is that the input carry is one. And so you have a normal adder for the lower part, uh, like it could be whatever structure, could be a ripple carry adder. Then you have two ripple carry adders uh, for the upper part, assuming respectively zero carry and one carry. And then finally, you have a, a mux that uh, selects between the two outputs for the high half based on the output carry from the low half. That's the idea. So uh, almost like textbook divide and conquer. Um, well, I should mention that what I just described is called, it's called for some reason that I don't quite understand, they call it carry select when you're doing it at one level. So for example, um, let me uh, let me replace a bunch of these numbers with like, with n so I can easily instantiate it. Um, uh, so I can easily instantiate it uh, for different sizes because we'll, we'll probably need something bigger to illustrate uh, some of these recursive constructions. Okay. Um, and so I'm going to use n for this too. This is going to be n. And this is n. This is n. Let's just verify that all this stuff still works. It doesn't. Therefore, okay. So that still works. Now let's make it eight. Uh, now we're testing sixty-four thousand combinations for the adder. Um, yeah, there's probably some of this stuff that wasn't designed for that many bits. Yeah, oh, like this one. Some some of these I'm just going to leave it for because I don't want to change those. Um, this is going to take a while. 64,000 combinations for each of these cases. Let's see how far we got. I'll, I'll, I'll make it smaller. Okay, we're still in number one. So we've gotten to, we've done 16,000 combinations. Um, but yeah, so um, uh, well, let's let's keep n, uh, let's keep n at eight, but let's just turn off the tests while we work on it, so we don't have to uh, to deal with that. Uh, where's the n? Where's the n? So let's put that here. Um, Let me just put this in a block, and then I can easily um, stuff this out if I want to. So uh, okay, um, so let's describe. So, so let's implement this idea I described. This is called a carry select adder, and um, I'm going to. I haven't actually done this before, but this seems like a, an interesting way of expressing it. Uh, I'm going to let you pass in two functions, constructor functions that I will call low adder and high adder, and um, I want these to, um, so let's see, you, you pass in a number of bits, um, you pass in a number of bits and a low adder and a high adder. What I want from these functions, low adder and high adder, if I call them with an integer, I want them to instantiate a carry uh, that we can feed stuff into basically. Um, so let me see here. What do we have to feed in? Maybe that's not the right way to do it. Actually, let me let me do it more bare, more manual, so you can see exactly what's going on. Um, let me just write this as, as directly as example uh, example eleven. So we have x and y, and they're um, 
you know, they're 8 bits. So n over 2 is 4 bits. And what we're going to do is we're going to call add, um, and I'm going to use the ADC formulation because we need to be able to control the carries. Actually, we don't need for the low. So what I'm going to do is, I'm, first of all, I'm going to define an integer, to, an integer i, which basically just cuts the, the range in half. Then I'm going to take the first half of bits, and I'm going to add those. I'm just going to use our normal ripple carry adder. So all I'm doing here is I'm instantiating the ripple carry adder that we know and love. Let me just make sure that add actually... Re okay, so this one, so I have to use ADC for that. That's fine. So, um, and we can feed, we can feed in the... No, let's not do that. So we just feed in a constant zero for the carry bit. Um, so we add the lower halves. Now, let me first show you what we're not going to do, but it's an equivalent construction to a ripple carry adder, which might elucidate why... Um, um, how, how the carry selects construction work. Uh, one thing you can do is you can, th this is not really divide and conquer, this is just cut stuff in half, but uh, it doesn't really give you any additional uh, leverage. But uh, what you can do is you can simply, so let's do it this first. This is just a ripple carry adder, but rather than working a bit at a time, I'm working in bigger chunks. So I'm recursively instantiating an adder for the low half and one for the high half, and then I'm just connecting them together via the carry chain. Um, and then I'm just going to say that the output is going to be the concatenation of the low bits and the high bits, and that's it. Um, so let me just first show you that this is this works. This is a. I'm going to put this back to four because I do want to run tests on this to prove to you that it works. Um, so this is example eleven, and I want to con you know as before I want to show you that this actually. Uh, this actually works. So you can see it works. Uh, this is, like I said, this is nothing new, uh, but rather than instantiating uh, sort of a full bit adder, a full bit adder, sort of at the bit level, I'm just cutting it in half and connecting things up. <clears throat> so this is really just a recursive way of writing a ripple carry adder, but it's uh, it's a good intermediate point to a carry select adder. Now we're going to, to basically, uh, like I said, rather than directly feeding in C low, which has uh, a delay that we, we don't want to wait on it, basically, what I'm going to do is I'm going to write um, two versions of what can happen, and I'm going to instantiate one with, uh, with constant carries, depending on the two possible input carries. And I'm going to call these uh, uh, high zero and high one, depending on what the assumed input carry is for those. Um, and then for uh, when we do, when we construct the final product, the, the, the low part is the same, right? Because we've not changed anything about that. But then for the high part, we're going to take the, um, we're going to mux between these two computed values um, and say, if there was an input carry, then we pick the, um, uh, then we pick um, we, we, we pick the result that assumed an input carry of, of 1L0. So it's really just, uh, com, you know, sort of simple-minded speculative execution. And this should be carry 12. I guess I didn't parenthesize correctly. Okay, so this compiles, and let's see if this works. Actually, here, we were computing with the sum, which works because of two's complement, but... Um, Let's just write it with u and just uh, so we don't so we're consistent with the earlier tests. So now we have example 12, and let's see if that works. So that works. Um, so you can see how what we basically do is we just take the the upper half and we speculate on the two possibilities, and then actually when we know which one to pick, we pick it. And what's so let's think about what the delay is of this thing. Why is this faster? It's faster because S low and S high one and S high zero, all of those can com compute in parallel basically because they have no interdependency. So um, the delay of this whole thing is going to be the max of the low part um, and the max of the high parts of which there are two. And those, the max of those are the same basically because they all do the same thing. Um, they have the same size. Uh, there's no dependency between them. But then we have to account for this extra mux delay. 
Um, and so basically, this has the, this has the same delay as a four bit adder plus the delay for the mux. So rather than uh, a, a, you know normally, which is basically like rather than doubling the delay for du rather than doubling the delay uh, by when we double the bit width, we just increase the delay by one. Right. Normally it would go from say eight to four if you think of it in terms of full adder delays. Now it goes from being with the ripple carry approach eight full adder delays to four ripple to to four full adder delays plus one mux delay. So that's the idea. Uh, and so when you do it this way, it's called carry select. You can obviously use multiple segmentation. So rather than using only uh, one thing like this, you can repeat this on like you could do a three-way split. Uh, you can do an uneven split, which is quite commonly done because, um, um, like, you might use a three plus five split or something like that, um, or a five plus three split. Like, you can use different splits uh, to balance the delays. Um, so anyway, that's a carry select adder. Now, this is the the, the, the part that, for some reason, um, when you do carry select, it's called carry select. But when you do it recursively, like, so I just mentioned that the magic of this thing is when you double the number of bits you're computing, you only add one mux delay for each doubling. Um, and so the first thing you should think of is why can't we just repeat that at every level, like divide and conquer? And if we do that, we should get logarithmic delay, right? Because every time we double the number of bits, we only add one mux delay to the chain. Um, and that does work. And it's basically just carry, like, it's what I would think of as carry select. It's just carry select at every level all the way down. Of course, you could terminate early and use a specialized structure near the leaves, but uh, you, you know you could could go all the way to single bits if you wanted to, uh, and, and uh, you know we will just to illustrate it. Uh, and if you do that, it's called a conditional sum adder. So let me just write this here. This is a uh, carry select adder. I'll call this recursive uh, ripple carry or carry ripple or ripple carry. Um, or divide and conquer, ripple carry. Um, and now let's do conditional sum. And for that, I'm going to use a, a function. So um, conditional sum adder, what I'm going to do is, like normal, I'm going to get in two bit vectors to add and a single bit thing for the input carry. And as before, I'm supposed to compute S and S the result, which is the bit vector, and C, which is a single bit. Um, oh, the Medicare, this was from some JSON parsing thing on Twitter. <laughs> um, all right, so here's the idea. Um, if we're down to a single bit, so, so first off, let's just, uh, to, to prevent any confusion, let's assert that we have two bit vectors of the same length. Uh, if we get down to a, a, bit, a, a length one uh, uh, thing to add, then we're just down to the case. Uh, then we just have a. Uh, I'm trying to remember if we have a function. It's called add three. Then we just have this. Uh, you know. Uh, you, you take some bits, and you add them. Um, and since we're supposed to return a bit vector. This is a small detail. Sometimes you have to be a little bit careful about the difference between a single bit and a bit vector of length one. Uh, there are some corrosions in place right now, but I haven't figured out quite how I want to handle it universally. Uh, but anyway, the bottom line is you want to, uh, given that add three itself works with single bits, not bit vectors, um, you want to first have subscript them like this. And uh, actually, I think if I just feed in, no, it takes a single bit. So I have to, I have to index them before I can feed them in. Uh, then you have to wrap S, S0 in, um, in bits, which constructs a bit vector. And then I return C. So uh, that's it for the base case, right? That's just a, a full adder. Uh, and now for the general case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, compute the splitting point, uh, which just has to be roughly halfway for the logarithmic delay thing to work out. And uh, then I'm going to um, simply do what we did here, basically, but now using our recursive function. So I'm going to um, I'm going to do this for the input C. Um, it's not right. So this is up to I, and this is from I. Um, and then here I'm going to say zero. 
this should be C high zero. And then the same thing with one. And then, again, we always have to return the result. So we're going to concatenate S low to the mux between uh, C low and uh, S high one and S high zero. And the final output is we also have to mux between, actually, uh, because we don't know wh whether it's one or the other. Uh, here we didn't have to do that because we weren't outputting the carry, but here we need to propagate it because we're using it recursively. Um, so I think that's it. Um, so let's now instantiate that. And I'm going to show you a diagram of this. Uh, actually, maybe let me, let me, before we do that, let me show you a diagram of um, of the 12. We tested it, but let's see a diagram just to see that, uh, that muxing structure. So you can see here, we construct, and this is where having this kind of bit vector construction notation is nice. You can see that the lower half of the output just comes from this circuit here. The upper half comes here, and it comes from the mux. And the mux is driven, the conditional signal is the output from the lower half's carry, and it's selecting between two independent uh, ripple carry adders that, that each have a hard-coded carry of inner uh, zero one here. So, so that was the sort of single level um, four bit adder. And now let's see what happens if we use our conditional sum adder, which is just carry select applied recursively. Let's see what happens if we apply that. Um, again, a four bit adder is too small t to justify this kind of recursive decomposition all the way to the bottom. But um, I just want to keep the numbers tractable so you can actually see what's going on. But of course, this, like I said, this is the kind of thing you want to start doing when you get over, say, 16 bits, maybe. Um, and so then we just call conditional sum adder x, y, and we feed in a zero because uh, there's no external carry. And then we want to make this into an output. Um, and so first, let's just look at the circuit, and then we'll test it. Only bit vectors may be indexed. So um, maybe I just didn't set up that constructor correctly. Um, uh, if this is a, what is it? If x type is bit, then let's just return. Uh, let's just do a coercion here. Okay. Okay. So this is quite a bit bigger. You can see you have the final output mux here as before, which selects what the final upper result is. But then to compute that in turn, um, you have a mux here. And so um, now you have muxes all the way down. You can see for the individual bits like uh, for the bit at index three, it computes uh, the out carry, assuming both a zero in carry and a zero out carry, then muxes between them and so on. And so this is, uh, I, I guess it's hard to see here. Let, let me make a bigger circuit just to show you, um, and I won't run the tests, uh, but just to sort of, sh sort of show you the, 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 the logarithmic depth so you can get a, an appreciation for it. Um, Some of these nodes don't represent like delays. They're just sort of uh, bookkeeping stuff. One, two, uh, three, four. So there's four muxes and because two to the four is 16. Um, and so f four muxes uh, plus, plus one adder is the critical path. Um, 
something like that. Now, in practice, this kind of circuit has all kinds of delay from the fact that there's long wires that have to join together different parts of the circuit and stuff. So this is a very partial story of, of, why, of, of what makes things fast in circuits. But uh, I think you can appreciate, I mean, this is hard to see exactly what's going on. But um, I think you can see that, uh, that there's a logarithmic number of muxes if we go through that chain. Um, so that's conditional sum matters. Let's actually test it. Uh, I put I put n back to four, and so even though this is a trivial case, again, I claim that if things are sufficiently kind of uniform, and in this case uniformity would be like it's a power of two, because in that case every level of every step of the way you're cutting things in half, um, uh, then. Uh, then I claim that if it works, say, with four bits, or I think even two bits, then it should work with any number of bits. But let's do four bits, since that's what we've been using. Um, and so let's just verify our old stuff still works, and then I will add the test. Example 11 is not defined. Did I forget? Did I, did I remove that? Um, that's odd. I thought I ran this code. Okay, so this works. Example 12 was the single level carry select, and so now we have example 13, which is the recursive carry select, aka conditional sum. Um, so let's do example 13. Okay, that doesn't work. Um, so there's a bug. 1 plus 16, which should be, you know, that should be 1. And we're saying it's 16. That's interesting. Okay. We probably have, have a bug here. Um, Let's see what it could be. We have a full adder for the base case. Um, that looks right. We feed in the input carry, we get the other one out, and then we return that. Um, then for the recursive decomposition, we, we, we pick a splitting index as the midpoint. We recursively instantiate carry conditional sum adder for the low bits with the input carry. Just propagated. Then we have the. Um, let's see. Then we have the two speculative instances for high, one assuming a zero in carry, and the other one assuming a one in carry. Um, S high zero, C high zero, S high one, S high, C high one. Then we concatenate S low with. Um, S high one if C low. Otherwise, um, and then for the, the for the carry out, we select between those. Hmm, interesting. So let's see here. Oh, one interesting fact is that this seems to have one two one bit too many, right? Um, like almost like it didn't have the right bit width. Um, oh, sorry. Let, let's wait until the assert fails. So x is one. This is was this the case that failed before? So it looks like we're just not masking somewhere in the compiler because this is, you know. The, this is uh, 0, and s is 16, right? So we're just not masking, and so this is not, I mean, this is the fun of writing the simulator at the same time as we're writing code, but it's not a bad idea. It's a good way of debugging it. It's going to be something simple, like there's uh, something we're not masking, basically.
So the sum, uh, the sum uh, is computed here t3. Um, b b before I dive into that, let me just, by masking on the output, let me just verify that this works. Okay, so if we just mask on the output, it works, but that shouldn't be required. There is a bug in the simulator. but So, so let me fix that. Um, but uh, anyway, just note that this, this works. <laughs> Uh, and it was pretty simple. It's just this idea instantiated recursively. What people do often do in practice is they will use heterogeneous um, architectures at different levels. For example, you might use Ripple carry uh, or some, you can use something called a carry look ahead adder, but for say four bit blocks. And then you can join those together with carry select headers to make a say a 16 bit block. Uh, and, and you know, so you can kind of use different approaches at every level and you can optimize, especially the leaf level blocks are highly optimized because you can lay those out knowing everything else and make them like a really compact hyper optimized block. Uh, and then you can combine them up the tree, uh, depending on what makes sense and, and what your design goals are. Like if you're optimizing, sometimes the uh, delay might, might not be the most important thing. Like you know you have slack, and so you use a more area efficient architecture rather than just going all out for delay. But um, let's figure out why that's not being masked correctly. It would be nice if I could single step through it, um, but in the absence of that, I can. Um, I can certainly instrument it, uh, which I'm going to do by uh, um, If you pass in trace when you're uh, compiling, you get a trace of every intermediate value. Um, and so this would be, uh, I guess, uh, dust is the name. So wait, let me let me think about. Uh, there's two levels. <laughs> there, there's, I guess you can do it like this. Because like one of them is quoted and the other one isn't. It's kind of why I was... Um, let's write it like this. Because it's quoted in one case and not in the other. So first, uh, let's just verify that this, you know, still quote unquote works. And then let's do a trace of this so we can see how the values evolve and where the bug in the compilation code is. So T12 is 16. Uh, Just copy that to another window. Um, so what was that? Uh, T3. This was at example 13, I think. Um, so T3, okay. T72. So it says T316. What is T4? T4 is zero. Um, so T4 is, well, I can't see that value, but I know what it was. Um, T4 was zero. So zero, one, It seems like just the operation this came from T 
So this is constructing an 8-bit quantity, right? Or it's trying to. No, 4. What about some of the other stuff there? Um, so it's my vector construction code that's busted. Um, so when you're doing your concatenating bits, you compute the types of the operands course and um, from those widths so for the first operand you don't do a shift because it's already in the right position otherwise you shift by the offset that you are at at that point then you, you you do the offset plus width afterwards if that were the case then um, So let's look at our code for conditional sum adder. The concatenation is here. S low is going to be 2. Um, the width of, of this is going to be 2 as well because it's the, the common width of the two operands. Um, And so the total width of this thing, uh, no, that's not it. Okay, let's remove the trace because I think I see why well, I understand the problem. I don't understand why the code is getting compiled that way. Um, zero and one to the four. That would mean that this thing here is treated as four bits. Let me split this out. Let me assert certain things. Um, the length of S should be the length of S low plus uh, the length of s high, which should be the length of x. This should be a single bit. Um, Oh, and of course, I have to return this. Okay. So it looks like the widths there are actually fine. Um, it's not somehow related to this, is it? No. Um, All right, well, let's uh, step through some of the compiler code and see what happens when we get here. So offset is zero for the first operand. Iterate through the operands um, with one terms append. Offset plus width. Okay. 
So now the offset is one. Okay, there was only one upbrand. It's fine. Let's uh, let me see something bigger. Okay. Okay, so this is a new thing. There's two operands. Uh, presumably, they have the same length as they should. Uh, as they should. Oh, they don't. They don't. Um, Sorry about running into these bugs, but sometimes you just do and you have to fix them. Um, X, 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 Y, Y, Y. S is the concatenation of those two. We verify that the length of S is the sum of them, which it should be. Because the high and low are symmetric completely. Um, we verify that the length of S is the same as the input operand length. Then we construct this, we verify this is a single bit, and then we return that. Um, So, for example, the initial one is 4. You divide it by 2. It's now 2. You take everything up to index 2, which is 0 and 1. 0, 1. Everything starting at index 2 up to the end, so that's 2, 3. Um, let me look at the graph. So that's example 13. Maybe there's something weird with the graph that we can just see at a glance. Um, Oh, it's this. Oh, I'm so stupid. It's because the function returns a tuple. Okay, I'm just a moron. The function returns a tuple, and because of some of the coercion logic I have, it treats it as a concatenation. Um, so it was computing the five-bit result, which is, I mean, actually is, is not a bad thing to compute. Like, that's a useful thing. And in fact, if you computed this with I mean, let me show you. Uh, okay. Anyway. We should just have looked at the graph. That's why the graph is great. Like, this kind of stuff is impossible to see without the graph, because the graph has all the inferred types and whatnot. So, yay graph. Boo me. Um, 
So yeah, do you see even without, like if we compute it with an extra output bit like this, then we get everything correct even without wrapping. If we, uh, if we want to um, output just those lower bits, the, the original bits, uh, then you have to do it like this. And now that won't, now we won't get the right result because we're not masking. And now we will, hopefully. All right, that was it. Um, false alarm. It was not even where I was looking. So reminder, look at the graph. Reminder to self, look at the graph. All right. Um, so what we did there was, um, let me do carry look ahead adders. Uh, so I don't think we have time for shifters today. I think in 30 minutes, I can do a couple of carry look ahead adders with uh, some basic parallel prefix circuits. And I can show you uh, another way you can do sort of fast adders. And, and these are more representative maybe of, of what people use in practice. Um, so uh, the idea of speculative execution is going to be part of carry look ahead adders too. But um, rather than directly computing the output bits, we're going to focus, we're going to split up the problem differently. Instead of directly computing the output bits and doing divide and conquer on how to combine the output bits the way we did with conditional sum and carry select, we're going to split the problem into two phases. Uh, the first phase is, you know, first, when we've been looking at all these REPL carry adders, the problem is the carry chain. So let's split the problem up. Let's compute the carry chain first without directly computing the output bits. And then once we have the carry chain, suppose we can compute all the carry bits uh, that would that would be uh, propagated to each stage, each position of the result. Um, if we know that, then we can compute the final result just by XORing that with the bitwise XOR of the components, right? So you can just, if you could somehow magically compute the carries for all the bits, with a black box, let's say, just to sort of do wishful thinking. Then we could compute the sum by simply uh, XORing that with the XOR of the operand bits. Um, and so that's called carry look ahead edition. And the idea is to, to somehow do some fancy stuff to calculate the adder, the carries, the, the whole carry chain fast and parallel using similar speculative execution ideas. And then, uh, and then combine that with the operand bits on the output in order to actually compute the final sum bits. That's the idea behind carry look ahead edition. So, um, so one way to think about it is you're going to have a final addition phase that takes a carry bit vector. So now the carry is going to be a bit vector that corresponds to all the final carries in those positions. And then you're just going to XOR, you know, it's like a, a three operand XOR in order to compute the final output. Um, and um, let me give sort of, I'm going to abbreviate the derivation because I don't have time to talk about everything I would want to cover necessarily. Uh, oops. If you go back to what we were doing to derive our ripple carry adder, our basic result is that we have some function, which I'll just call, well, let's call it add three because that's what it is. Uh, and I will, I will split out, I won't, you know, I'll call it C in and C out. So given the bits in a certain position, um, you know, and the incoming carry, we can compute the sum in that position and the outgoing carry. Suppose we restructure this. Uh, first, let me write this a little bit differently so we have an expression um, uh, that's sort of indexed by, by the different positions. So what I'm going to say is that, um, I guess you can write it a few different ways. Um, here's one way to write it. Um, you take, you can, you can use these indexes differently. Like you can call this plus one and this I, or you can do it like this. And if you do this, then the incoming carry from the very bottom is index minus one. Um, but uh, this is the convention for whatever reason. Uh, it's a little bit more convenient maybe. So this is basically the same equation, but written out index wise. And so we don't have to think of C in and C out as being unrelated. They're just adjacent elements of a vector. So C is now a vector. Um, and the idea behind carry, um, the idea behind um, carry look ahead addition is let's split out just the computation of the carry components. And so that's what you have here. Um, and actually, let's use this formulation. I like this a little bit better. 
uh, personally, because then all the input bits are in the same position. So what do you do? So, and I'm not going to call this carry because or add three because it's not really computing the add. It's just computing the output carry from the input carry and the operand bits. So I'm going to write this function called carry, and the only job of this function is given x, y, and c for that given position, compute the carry in the next position. Uh, and if you want to write it out very explicitly, uh, I mean we've we've done it before. Um, you can write it in in, in different ways, but um, uh, one thing you can do is you can write these two intermediate results that are called carry and propagate for reasons that uh, may be immediately apparent, but uh, that I will indicate as we go along. Um, and then, and you can just derive this from the truth table like we did when we originally derived the full adder. And then, in order to compute the output carry, you here's how you reason: um, if g is true, that means both of the input bits, the, the, the non-carry input bits, the operand bits. Both of those are true. In, in that case, there is always an output carry regardless of the input carry. So if G is true, then there's always an output carry. Otherwise, um, if the input carry is set and at least one of the bits is set, both can uh, both can be set, that's fine, but at least one of them has to be set, um, then there's an output carry as well. That's why it's called the propagate. So generate means regardless of the input carry, there's always an output carry. Propagate means there's an output carry if and only if there is a input carry. So it propagates the input carry to the output. That's why it's called propagate. Um, so this is the, this is just the carry function. And really what we're trying to do is we're trying to compute this vector, this carry vector, bit vector, efficiently. Um, and um, here's how I'm going to do that. <laughs> um, I'm going to partially apply carry. So basically the point is here. Suppose we can somehow pre we can somehow uh, we can define a function which I will call i sub i carry sub i sorry, which um, is going to take ci's input, and it's just literally defined this way. So you're just partially applying uh, the x's and y's. But it's a but 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 the the nice thing about it is you can think of it as a standalone function with just one argument because if you formulate it in this way which, you know, it's like currying or partial application of functional programming. Then you have something that, that takes a single argument in, a uh, single argument as input produces a single output. Um, and then if you trace this chain all the way from the beginning um, using this new formulation, for example, um, so, so Z0 is going to be the initial external carry input. But if I compute C1, then it's uh, C0. X, uh, C0 of this, if I want to do C2, it's carry 1 of C1. And the thing to note here is that if you just recursively expand this, uh, this is equivalent to this. And just to, to, to be annoying about it, let me finish this chain. Um, and so on. Um, and if you, you know, and, and and so the point is, if th this recursive equation for the C's is basically saying that uh, what you want to compute is the composition of all these functions corresponding to the lower positions, and then uh, after you've com uh, after you compose that chain of functions that correspond to the carry propagation, uh, you then feed the initial input carry, and that will give you a um, the, 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 the carry output in the position you're interested in. And this is called carry look ahead because it's kind of looking, it's really, I guess you could say, look behind. It's really, you know, going all the way potentially back to the very first bit and using a, a circuit that's kind of specialized to calculate sort of the fast propagation uh, to the position you care about. So um, anytime you have, uh, we, we talked earlier about parallel prefix circuit. Did we talk about parallel prefix circuit? No, we didn't talk about parallel prefix circuits. We talked about um, um, reduction circuits for uh, computing XOR, like parity circuits, if you remember, um, where if you want to uh, compute the XOR of a bunch of different things, uh, then you can group them sort of in pairs uh, and build a binary tree that has logarithmic depth rather than you know a slow linear chain. And you can basically do the same thing for these carry look-ahead chains, even though this looks inherently serial. If you can somehow find a way 
to represent these carry functions, and we have a representation right here. It's P and G. P and G totally describe a given carry function. Once we've uh, once we know x and y, we can compute the p uh, the p and g that correspond to them. And at that point, a given carry function for a given position is represented by p and g. And um, so, if you can find a way to sort of compose those functions, then you can combine them in this kind of reduction tree to compute the um, to have a fast circuit for computing the carry output for a given position directly from the input carry at the, all the way at the bottom of the chain. So in order to do that, we have to describe a composition law that corresponds to function composition. Um, and it's going to be the following. Uh, suppose I'm composing uh, a carry function. I'll just, rather than saying i and i plus 1, I will just say i and j. So they're two. They, they somehow they correspond to different things. And actually, let's not even say i and j. Let's commit to what the indices are. But they're two carry functions. They correspond to something of this sort where x and y have been plugged in, but but c is is sort of the unknown that you have to plug in in each instance. Um, and so dot here represents function composition. First, do carry prime, and then apply uh, uh, something to that. And so if I feed a c into this. What I mean is, it, it's something like this. And if you expand what this means in terms of the given PGs, uh, this means G and P and G prime or P prime and C. And if you expand this and you kind of collect terms that correspond to the G and P for the composition, you get that, um, let's call it g prime prime. Uh, basically, you want to rewrite this in an equivalent form that looks like this. And you can take my, let me show you the solution, and then I'll explain intuitively what it means in terms of combining two things that propagate and generate stuff. Um, what this basically means is carry prime goes first in the carry chain, then carry goes after. And so if you want to have a carry generate, either the top thing can generate by itself, regardless, or the top thing can propagate and the bottom one can generate. Uh, propagation is easier. Something can only propagate through the composition of two, two chains if it propagates through one chain and then through the other chain. So here we just do it like this. So this is the composition law. And um you know you can call it like i don't know f uh, maybe instead of primes i'll use just one and two right so we have two functions i'll just call them f1 and f2 because they represent functions and so you have p p1 uh, p1 g1 is f1 so we unpack those components um and then i return a new tuple corresponding to this so the first one was uh p so for this, and then for the second one, it's uh, G1 and uh, P1 and G2. So that's the composition law. So just like before, we had XOR, which is a thing that takes two things, in that case, bit vectors. In this case, it takes these pairs of bits that represent the carry propagation behavior of a certain part of the chain. Here we have our own custom function. But nevertheless, the, the same reduction circuit can be used. Uh, the same reduction circuit can be used because this is an associative operator. Function composition is always associative. It may not be apparent that this operation is associative, but composing functions is associative. Meaning, if if you have FG, you, you can you can either compose in this order or in this order. Uh, that's just universally true for function composition in general. Uh, it turns out that because this formula is equivalent to function composition for this particular propagate generator representation, this has to be associative as well. Uh, in order to actually prove that it's associative in this particular representation, you would have to do some Boolean algebra, but you can also just appeal to the fact that it corresponds to function composition and function composition is associative. Um, so anyway, this is the thing we want to compute. And so, um, and I'll call this PG compose. Um, actually, let me call them PG1 and PG2, just to be more consistent about the naming convention. Um, and now the job is going to be, we, we're given vectors x and y. 
we first have to compute the corresponding, uh, the initial, the ones that correspond to this. And so we, we, we are going to compute um, a PG vector. So suppose these are vectors, right? We're going to compute a PG vector, which is simply um, uh, the first component is uh, the propagate. So it's going to be, uh, it's going to be like this. The second is the generate. So it's going to be like this. Um, let's call it XI and YI. Uh, and then I'm going to sift together those two bit vectors. And so for every position, we're going to compute a vector, a, a, a list of pairs. And those pairs represent the carry propagation function for that position. Um, and so then what we want to do is we want to compute, um, and, and I'll first show you a brute force solution. Well, it's brute force, it's logarithmic depth, but it's needlessly wasteful in area, which goes as follows. Once you have this PG vector, you can compute the carry vector by, um, by taking this PG vector, slicing it, taking the first uh, I elements, so we only care about the carry propagation up to the position we care about, um, and I'll call this PG carry, and feeding in zero, because let's just say there's no, you know, zero would be the C minus one or something like that, uh, or I guess C zero in this notation, it would be the lowest bit of carry input um, for the whole thing. Um, and PG carry is actually, um, is actually just the generate equation. Um, because, so this whole chain, you're trying to figure out if this whole chain carries given a C, and it is just the same equation from here, uh, fr from this, from here. Because if you go back to the original equation, that was what we wrote here, right? Um, so this is just uh, P and C like this. Um, and so we have to do something like this, um, which you can again write as a bit vector. Um, And I'll, I'll show the, the better, more real way of, of doing it afterward, but this is the easiest to understand, where we just use a reduction tree independently for each output operand. And so you go through um, each of those positions. Um, you compute the carry. This is right. So you want to take everything up to... I guess this is right, this might be off by one, but, but let's say something like this. And so that gives you the carry vector, and then if you want to compute the sum vector, now it's just a bitwise uh, XOR of these three components. Oh, sorry, PG carry, uh, you have to compose this chain. So you have to reduce the chain using PG compose. This is the associative reduce. Um, something like that. This is the logarithmic thing. So uh, even for the very last uh, carry output component, which is the one that you normally think of as having the longest critical path, it's only going to do a logarithmic uh, depth reduction over all the previous carry, uh, carry bits. So that's logarithmic depth there. And so compute that and then compute the final sum output, something like this. Um, so let's try putting this into practice. How are we doing on time? We're going a little bit over time. I started late, so I don't feel bad about that. Um, we'll be able to finish this. So, um, this is the idea. And so I will call this carry look ahead adder. And I'm, I'm actually going to parameterize this part here. Um, and call it scan. Uh, 
Um, PG carry of PG zero for PG in scan Um, this is the original PG vector. This is the composed PG. Um, what's a good, let me call it PGI. Um, for the ith position. And then to compute the actual carry, we compose it with the zero output, which is just going to end up being, you know, G basically, but I'm going to write it like this just to emphasize kind of the general structure. Um, and so, in order to do this, we have to feed in x and y, and we're going to feed in a scan circuit, uh, a function. So, the, we're going to parameterize by the function that's responsible for taking the, the, the independent chain of all the PG pairs and then composing into what's called the parallel prefix or the scan, which is just the thing we covered. Um, it's it's just the thing where at every position you want the composition of everything before it, but you want to do it quickly, ideally. Um, so actually, let me do it slowly and then show you what it looks, just, just to verify it. Because we have the, both the linear reduce and the logarithmic reduce in this thing. So um, I think that's right. Example 14. I will instantiate it with something called linear scan, which um, is going to be, um, so we take f and we take a vector uh, x. The first element so A will be a running, a, a Y is going to be a running accumulator that represents the result up to that point, basically. Uh, and so Y starts out uh, starts out as the first element of X, and, um, and then you iterate over everything after that. And in every position, you combine the new element with the existing element, then you have to yield it. So you, you yield these in order. You have to yield the first element too, the way we define it. Sometimes people define a version without like that sort of off by one in terms of whether the first element is just uh, the, the naked element or already has F uh, combined with something else. But uh, the normal version is this, I believe. So this is linear scan. And this is going to yield a generator that outputs as many elements as there are elements in X. Um, and actually, before I do this, let me show you what scan looks like for something like XOR, because that's something we've looked at before, and it's going to be less sort of noisy. So suppose um, suppose uh, we, we do the XOR scan here. So we have an input vector i, and we want to take all the bits. Uh, I'm going to make it 8, because we want to see what's going on. I uh, have some more bits to show that structure. And uh, we first do the linear scan. And so we're going to, come to, to pass in a function x, y, um, which is just going to be xor, as in our previous examples. And then uh, pass in i. And I get out a generator, so I then have to, um, well, I have to pass it to output in any case. Um, but that also turns the generator into a bit vector. Um, Okay, that's not the right circuit. Did we not run this? Okay. So, you hopefully remember this circuit. If you didn't, it's pretty straightforward. This is the XOR of everything done with a linear chain. But you can see we're outputting all the intermediate results, which means that this element here is the XOR of everything be before it in the chain which is just this itself. This thing here 
It's the XOR of everything before it in the chain, which includes itself and its predecessor. This thing here, XOR of 0, 1, 2. 0, 1, 2, 3. Do you see? So th this is the what I what is called the parallel, well, this is not a very parallel prefix, but this is a prefix, uh, a prefix circuit, a scan circuit that computes this. Um, and this can be done using, you know, we went from this kind of thing to a logarithmic reduction tree. Turns out you can do the same thing for scan. And that's what we will do. But let's start with this uh, for the carry look ahead adder just to verify that we test one thing at a time. So um, let's actually just leave this here as a standalone test case, and then let's do the carry look ahead adder. Um, and so uh, we have an output is the is the carry look ahead adder, and I'm going to use linear scan. So I'm going to pass in the linear scan function. There's there's going to be some off by one bugs, but uh, let's see what happens. Okay, and so let's output this and see what we get. This doesn't look too bad. Um, it might be helpful to... Um, well, this is definitely not right. Is it? Oh, I guess it is. Um, without necessarily trying to understand it in the terms of the specific structure, Let's just try to test it um, for now. Like I kind of explained it abstractly, um, but I'm not—it's not sure that at this level you can necessarily gain all that much by looking at it. Uh, and I'm sure there's probably issues here, but let's see. Uh, two positional parameters. Oh, it's, uh, I think, 15, right? 14 was the scan circuit for XOR. Okay, so that doesn't work. That's fine. So it says 1 plus 1 uh, is, of course, 1, and it says that's 15. Um, so let's see here. Plenty of potential for, for mix-ups and this kind of thing. Um, let's see, first thing we do, PG, the first component is P, if either of the bits are set, then we propagate, second one is G, if both of them are set, then we generate, so that's PG, we did use that ordering consistently, yes we did. Okay, now, Given that PG vector, we com we compute the scan uh, we compute the, the the scan circuit, aka the parallel the parallel prefix circuit, uh, with this composition operator. Um, now, one thing that could totally be the issue is that uh, the operand order is wrong in terms of whether the bits go high low or low high or something like that. Um, so, let, so let's see here, because this is associative, but it's definitely not commutative. There's a or there's a causality of things going from low to high. So let's see how we were doing things in the scan circuit. Um, the second operand here is the lower, or the first operand corresponds to the lower bits. So that's the problem. Uh, the second operand corresponds to the new bits. So um, the chain, the, comp the composed chain generates if the top thing generates, or if the top thing propagates and the low one generates. Okay, that still doesn't work. It's the same issue. Okay, but I think at least that was one thing. Um, so P is this definitely. G, the second argument is the new incoming thing, G2 or P2 and G1, all right. Okay, so this is the scan circuit. So this means when we iterate over this, for every position, and I wonder if this is off by one. No, it's not. I don't think it is. Um, so that gives us the carry 
uh, the propagate carry representation up to that position. And so if you add this, you should get the right result. So for example, the very first thing we get out, um, and, and this is probably where looking at the, uh, the circuit could be potentially informative. So let's look at, um, let's see. the lowest bit here. So you can see this here is just the independent XOR of those uh, of the two vectors, which ultimately gets combined with the, the carry vector. And so the carry bit um, is um, I think that is off by one. I think this is off by one. Um, so um, what we're going to do in order to compute I think we have to shift it over. We have to shift it over by one. And then uh, add a lower zero. Let me just make it into a bit vector, then we can use these operators. Um, let's see here. But yeah, the very first, I'm working, I'm live, come on. Um, so let's see, the very first element of the PG vector corresponds to the PG computed immediately from this. So that actually is the thing that should be used for the next position, which is why we do this. So the um, because the very lowest uh, order some bit should just be the let's compute this should just be the XOR of the input bits, right? So that means the least significant bit is correct. Uh, then, let's see. The carry for this is if both of them, if both of the components are set, Uh, or either of them is set and zero. So this thing is just, so if both of them are set, uh, then there's a carry. Oh, you're right. I cut it out. I'm sorry. You're right. You're right. You're right. I should, I should cut it from the top. I was slicing it in the wrong way. I want to do this. Okay, that passes. <laughs> yeah, thanks for catching that. Yeah, so the, I want to slice off the top bit because we don't propagate that out. Um, we could, like if we wanted to, um, If you wanted to compute the ultimate output carry, you would basically do this. No. Well, anyway, if you, if you just want to compute the sum without the, the ultimate output carry, this is it. Anyway, okay, this works. 
Um, thanks for catching that typo. So yeah, this works. Obviously, a bunch of this can be con constant folded with things like these zeros and whatnot. But but anyway, so that works. So far, though, this is basically a ripple carry adder written in a weird way because there's still a linear chain because of the linear scan circuit. So you can see that one of the nice things about using GraphWiz for visualizing stuff is it, that it, it does layer. It tries to make everything feed forward, and it tries to minimize the number of layers and lay things out naturally in layers. So you can get a pretty good idea of the depth of the circuit by looking at how many layers there are, like how many columns there are of stuff. It's not perfectly uh, reliable, but anyway, it, st it still has that kind of linear depth because we're using a linear scan circuit. But now the idea is that we've separated the idea of a carry lookahead adder from exactly how these uh, these prefixes are computed uh, to generate the carry vector. Uh, and so now we can move to a, uh, a fancier scan circuit. So linear scan is here. Um, let's do um, I will call it brute force logarithmic scan, um, which is just using what we already know from earlier. So um, what you do is for every position, um, for every position, you simply instantiate a logarithmic reduce circuit uh, for that specific output element. So we already have logarithmic reduce. Um, and what we simply do is we do logarithmic reduce. Um, we do logarithmic reduce on everything up to that position. Um, this may be off by one because the top element doesn't include uh, the element. So I think we have to do it like this. Um, And so let's try, well, let's leave this here. Uh, and then we'll try uh, brute force logarithmic scan. Let's see if that works. And it passes. I mean, we have tests, right? It works. Let's look at what the circuits look like. Um, some of these things are not necessarily the nicest to look at. Um, one thing we can do is we can take our PG compose and we can wrap it up into a module uh, just so we can see kind of the block structure. And so um, um, This doesn't change anything about the circuit other than how it's structured into submodules. But this is a good idea once you want to see things only kind of at one level. Uh, so this is G2 and P2 and G1. Um, and one nice thing you can do with modules like this is um, you can still use a function to instantiate them because the way submodules are enclosed in a parent module is by trans transitive dependency. So you don't have to like add it directly to the module. As long as you're dependent on something that depends on the module, you'll pull it in. Uh, and so now you can simply do uh, you can simply do this. Um, something like this. And so this still works, but now if we look at the circuit, um, it would be even easier if we had tuple inputs. I mean, we could do that, but then we would have to keep packing and unpacking bit vectors. Um, but this is a little bit better, at least. You can sort of see uh, which things have to do with uh, the PG composition uh, versus other stuff. Uh, of course, with, with only two levels, it's not necessarily the most, um, uh, it's not the, the most uh, obvious what's going on. So I'm going to temporarily turn off the tests and make the vectors bigger. Um, 
just so we can get an idea of how things go when, when we get bigger. Um, one, two, three. One, two, three. Um, and not coincidentally, two to the three is eight. So you have three layers of PG. Uh, there is a ton of redundancy in this circuit because, uh, so that's the next one we're going to fix. Even though this has logarithmic delay, uh, logarithmic number of PG units, each of which has constant delay, uh, we're doing something really wasteful here in terms of area, which is that we're instantiating a completely separate circuit for every output element. It's possible that by sheer dint of luck, it will be able to share some intermediate values using, uh, you know, interning. It automatically interns uh, operators and such. But uh, you want to use a structure that, that is more expressly based on, uh, on trying to share results rather than just doing this brute force way. But you still want to have something that's logarithmic in depth. So um, um, let me do the simplest one I know, which is called a Skilansky circuit. Uh, and the way this works is we're just going to do divide and conquer. So rather than doing something like this or something like this, we're going to say, let's com recursively compute um, the scan result for the lower half and the upper half. The lower half uh, is already then correct, and then we just have to propagate the last element of the lower half into the upper half. Um, and so we need a termination case, as always. Um, if we're down to one element, we have to return a list of things. So it's going to be basically x itself, because x is already a uh, like a vector or a, you know a, a, a collection. Um, Otherwise, we will uh, we will split x in half, and uh, I will call the output y like we did up here. So I have y low, which is just going to be uh, I'll call this Skilansky scan. This is shorter, but it's divide and conquer. Um, you recursively uh, apply f the same operator to the low half, and then you apply it to the high half. And then the low half is correct because you know the sort of causality goes from low to high, so all the low stuff is already internally correct. But the high bits were computed without assuming anything about the low half. So this is kind of like the speculative execution thing with conditional sum adder. We somehow have to do a, a final step in order to propagate um, propagate things into the high half. And the way we do that is we uh, we take the last element. I'll just call it y. We'll take the last element of y low, which is basically the PG up to that point, up to the halfway mark, right before the high part starts, uh, and then you PG you you compose that with um, with everything in the low half. Uh, I guess it's not really x at this point; it's like xi. Let's let's call it. Uh, I mean, we, we, we can just directly edit here. Don't want to have too many variables. For y i n y high, like this, um, you can just write it as a list concatenation. In which case, you have to make this a list as well to make sure they concatenate. Um, or you can write it as a bit concatenation. In which case, um, you have to do this. Is that right? No, let's just do it like a list thing. That's probably a little bit easier to reason about. Um, so let's see. We, we take the, high, the, the low part, um, and then we have to update the high part by propagating the last part of the last result in that over something like that. Um, and then we try this. We didn't test, so let's just see if it compiles let's uh, let's go back and test it uh, with a more reasonable parameter no idea what that hotkey is that I press so this works look do you see how much smaller it was like 
this this shrunk massively, right? Um, oh, that's because I went down to n equals four. I shouldn't calm, calm down, pair. Uh, yeah, I thought that was a little bit much. But, but let's see the before and after with uh, Sklansky versus our brute force logarithmic scan with eight bits, where we can kind of get an idea of the heft. So this is with Sklansky. Uh, this is with brute force logarithmic. And you can see it's dramatically larger. And it gets larger quadratically in the number of bits because it can't really share anything the way it's written with the brute force approach. But it is logarithmic, which is nice. Um, but yeah, uh, Skolansky scan, how are we doing on time? I think I can finish with one more scan circuit, um, but this is the simplest. And as you can see, it's, 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 not, it's only marginally more costly than a kind of a linear scan circuit. Um, boom, boom, boom. Yeah, um, the add operator is was introduced in Python 3.5 or 3.6 for matrix multiplication. And so it has the right precedence to act like a multiplication-like operator, and I'm using it for concatenation because it's such a common concatenation is such a common operation when you're doing this kind of, sort of HDL stuff with circuit design. So anyway, that's um, that is <laughs> fast adders. Uh, Skolansky adders aren't used a whole lot in practice, although I think they are. Um, let me show one more, which is definitely used in practice. Uh, Brent Kung. The way Brent Kung works is, first off, you always terminate in the same way, basically. Uh, and it is based on divide and conquer, but in, a, in, a, in an interesting way. Basically, what you do is, <clears throat> rather than cutting the vector in half, sort of right in the middle, and then recursing on the two halves that are each n over 2 in size, or roughly one half in size, right? You, you, you merge the vector to n over 2 in size before you recurse. And so you only, re, you, only have, uh, you only have one recursion step, um, I guess, right? Um, no, basically, I guess you, you recurse on the even and odd halves. Let me just, let me see if I remember what I wrote. I, I've written some of these before. I just never tested it. Um, I think this is Brent Kung. Let me just crib from it uh, to remind myself of, of the easy Python way of writing it. Yeah, no, I was right. There's only one recursion. There's not two. The reason there's not two is you pre you pre combine odd and even elements. Um, so let me just write this out. So you recursively scan. Uh, on a list composed by first merging things in odd and even pairs. So you take all the even elements and you take all the odd elements. Um, and I guess in my version I put F first. So for example, if you're using this to compute um, a parallel prefix circuits for XOR or SUM or something like that, First, to all the odd elements, index one, two, one, three, five, and so on, you add the preceding low element. So after this step, you basically folded in the odd and even elements together, uh, and then you recurse on that. And um, then you have to basically, let's see, how did I write this? You have to deinterleave. So the thing you get out from this, you have to pass through some things, right? Okay. The first element has to be passed through unmolested, um, and then for the other stuff, yeah, for the other stuff, you you take the odd, the even elements and you combine them with the the lower odd counterparts. Um, and this unsip is like an even odd, uh, un, I mean, it's like the opposite of, uh, I'll just copy it over. 
let, let me run it at the com uh, let's see what what I did here. Print Kung scan, so you do boom boom. Let me show you the idea behind Uncep uh, because if I take, um, I don't know, if I take integers between uh, 0 and, and 10 inclusive and uh, 10 and 20, let's just make this into a list. Then we go from a, a pair of lists to a list of pairs. Um, if I unzip two things, then I merge them. So I guess maybe unzip isn't quite the right term. But basically, it's like, yeah, I don't think I should call this, this would be interleave. It's a bad name. Um, So uh, what I called unsub is really interleave. You interleave these two lists. So the, the first one goes in the even positions, and the second one goes in the odd positions. And the reason you have to do this with this Brent, Brent Kunk scan is that um, the result, the, the the thing you get from the recursive invocation, is already the right answer for the odd positions. And so that's why why get why why is gets passed through. But then for the even positions, you have to combine the like I said the previous odd counterpart to that even element via the um, the function in order to propagate those over. So it's sort of like you merge odd and even first, recurse, and then you have to pass through the elements, but also propagate out to the even elements that were not really uh, computed correctly during the recursion. I think that's the idea. That's how I think about it. But I don't know why I call it unsip. Unsip is sli it's a slightly different function. I must have been tripping when I wrote that. So let's see if that works. And I'll talk uh, afterwards about why you might prefer one over the other. But um, let me first make sure I'm not high. Okay, so let me use the notation I was using here. So this is x0. Uh, I will call this even odd. And then this here should be x i y i. Well, let's call this x even x odd, x even x odd. I will call this y odd. Um, Let's see, did I get some of these off? Um, So x, x is length 4, y has length 2. Um, is that what I meant to write? Shouldn't it be 2 here? Oh, it should. OK. Let's see if that works. will not work with this. Oh, it will, but it'll take forever. So that works. Um, let's look at the circuit in diagram form. So you can see this is also a small circuit. Um, one difference 
is that there's basically two phases to this. If you think about the original Skolansky circuit, we immediately recursed on the two halves. But then in order to join them together after finishing the recursion, there is this very wide fan out where all n over two lower element, or sorry, all n over two upper elements have to have something propagated out to them. And so if you implement it naively, you have what's called linear fan out. There's a single element, which is the, the, the top element and the lower result that has to be propagated out to the n over two other elements. On the other hand, it's a very shallow circuit. In fact, it's exactly logarithmic depth. Brent Kuhn, on the other hand, at every step, only has fan out two. You're only ever propagating down and to your neighbor. And that's true both in the first phase where you merge odd even and in the final phase where you finish where you spread out. You merge in and spread out. Each of those is fan out two. Um, the, the cost of that, it's that is that it's twice the depth, roughly, of, I mean, it's not apparent with these very shallow circuits probably, but you need basically, um, like rather than being logarithmic, base two log of n, it's like two base two, two, two base two log of n, because you go down and then you go back up. So it's sort of double depth, um, but it's very low fan out. It has a very regular circuit layout because you don't have long wires so much. It's mostly these sort of neighbor wires for the most part. Um, and in real circuits, anytime you have fan out beyond four typically, you need to use a tree to fan out. So if you have 32 elements uh, you know, if you have a 64-bit adder and you need to fan out for the final step in the Skolansky uh, circuit, you need to fan out 32 elements. Really, you have to do it in like, you know, first four and then another four and then a final two in order to go up to, thir to 32 terminals in a, in a fast way. So uh, fan out isn't free and it also leads to a lot of long wires typically. Whereas here, um, it's, a, it's a little bit deeper in terms of, uh, of logic levels, but since the fan out circuit already has sort of logarithmic depth. It's almost like the Skolansky circuit is already two times the log in disguise if you think of it that way. But here we're doing something along the way. We're not just fanning out and doing no logic function in the process. We're kind of doing stuff at every logic level. So it's sort of more efficient in that way. Um, there are yet other structures which we won't cover today. The other notable one is called uh, Kagi stone, um, which uh, has quite large area uh, but is also logarithmic depth. And, and it, it, so it's, it's kind of a mixture of the features of Skolansky and Brent Kung in that, um, like Skolansky, it has truly logarithmic depth, at least superficially. Um, but like Brent Kung, the fan out at every level is only two. Uh, on the other hand, it has a ton of nodes. Like basically what, one way to think about it is if you look at the Brent Kung uh, subdivision, it, you, you recurse only on half of the elements in a, uh, and then you, you, you make up for that by, by doing this propagation step after you return from the recursion. In a uh, Kagi stone adder, you're basically doing something with every element at every level. And so there's a ton of operations going on, a ton, I, I guess a ton more power consumption if you're measuring it in the circuit. Not that I'm an, I know much about that stuff, but um, anyway. So I think that's it for today. This was fast adders. We're not gonna be able to get to shifters and rotators today. Uh, but that's going to be quite a bit simpler than this. But I thought this is, I guess, some fairly advanced material, but I think it's neat how you can decompose it into these very simple, you know, three or four line functions. And, uh, you know, it's kind of pluggable. Like you can write the carry logit adder and then you can plug in different circuits for for the hard part of it um, and have different trade-offs. Uh, and you can even have different circuits for different levels. Like I said, like you can, for example, you can, if you have a 32-bit addition, you can pre-combine it into four-bit blocks, handle those at the leaf level however you want, then feed those into a carry look-ahead adder with some parallel prefix circuit or whatever. So this kind of modular approach is, is quite powerful in design exploration. And I think it's also uh, makes it, compared to just seeing crazy diagrams in books and papers, you can actually write down the code and understand what's going on. So anyway, that's it for today. Um, Yeah, so for people who thought the logic stuff was a little bit maybe too easy, hopefully this is getting more advanced. This stuff is normally not covered in intro courses, um, but I think once you have the scaffolding and if you're a sort of software-minded person who has no problem with recursion, for example, I think this stuff is pretty easy to understand. Uh, if my derivation of the carry look-ahead construction was a little too hard to follow, I don't blame you. Um, uh, 
there's a paper I can point to. Um, if you want to read it, I, I, I don't totally cosign. There's some stuff I don't like about it. Um, I'll put it in the uh, carry look ahead adder tutorial. This paper here, uh, it does some stuff differently than how I derived it. Um, but it's like, for example, rather than looking at it in terms of composing functions, it looks at it in terms of, it does look at it in terms of composing functions, but it looks at this not as a carry function, but as a state transition function for a bit serial adder, a little bit more geared towards electrical engineers. But, uh, but anyway, uh, this paper, uh, if you want to sort of get another take on this stuff, but in a similar vein, for, for this part of it, you can go look there. He also talks about Skolansky and Brent Kung and all those other things. So that's it for today. Um, next week, I will be back. I'm actually going to Denmark sometime next week for a month, and so stream schedule will be flipped to accommodate European hours, uh, and there may be some outages in that week as I get settled. Uh, I can't remember exactly when I leave. I think it's the third. So I guess most, most of next week I'll be here. Monday and Wednesday I'll be there. Then I'll be out for Friday, and I'll probably be back somewhere in the next week. But uh, anyway, that's it for me. Have a good weekend. I will see you on Monday. I will probably do more CryptoPal stuff this weekend, so if anyone's interested in that, uh, stay tuned. But otherwise, I'm out. There won't be after hours now. There will be after hours maybe tonight or tomorrow. But yeah, so uh, that's it for me. See you around.